Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Genova Burns, Terra CRG, Meridian Capital Group, Wickhoff Organization. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Amtrust Title, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Fisher Brothers, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hersha Hospitality, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and these friends. It's called Lower Manhattan. It's a place that everybody, visitors from around the world, companies are opening up. People want to stay there. They want to shop there. They want to live there. So today, I've assembled this group of business leaders to provide their insight on what's happening in Lower Manhattan. My guests include the legendary Larry Silverstein, the chairman of Silverstein Properties, who knows quite a bit about Lower Manhattan and is even going to move to live there with Clara. Joanne Podell, the vice chairperson, <laughs> I don't know, chairperson or chairman of Cushman and Wakefield. Eric Engelhardt, the director of leasing for the Durst organization. And last but not least, a man who learned Lower Manhattan by shoveling s snow in front of 156 William Street, my friend Steve Whitkoff, the chairman and CEO of the Whitkoff organization or the Whitkoff group. So, Larry, how many years have you truly been involved with Lower Manhattan before the Trade Center and, you know, with 120 Broadway and everything? I think we, um, we first got involved. We bought 120, it was 1980. It was 1980. I signed a ground lease with the Port Authority for the World Trade Center site, not, not to the north, right? Just to the north of the original Keystone site on which there was a Con Ed substation that was supposed to take a, a million square foot building, 40 stories, 25,000 feet on the floor. I signed a lease for that. I want a, I want a bid, public bid, by, I don't know, 25 cents or whatever it was. But then I was, got, the, got the right to build a million-foot building. And I, with time, expanded that to a two-million-foot building. And we built a two-million-square-foot building, Seven World Trade Center. You know, Steve started his roots, as I was saying, with 156 William Street and some other ones. What has happened today, you know, you're building a Four Seasons and, you know, needless to say, for, tra for the WTC. Steve is, owns a number of properties and he's building a luxury property, 111 Murray Street. The Durst Organization or the principal with the Port Authority had won. I mean, over the last 15 years, can either one of you imagine what has transpired? Well, truth of the matter is, I look back at the last 15 years, where the hell the time is going, I'm not quite sure. But what's extraordinary is the fact that in that period of time, we finished seven World Trade Center, one World Trade Center, four World Trade Center, three World Trade Center is topping out next week, be finishing by 2018. And then at the end of the day, two World Trade Center, someone's gonna come along for that, and that'll be it. 
and then we will finish the trade center in its entirety. By 2022, we should be out of it. But, but the trade center is only part of what has happened, the transformation. I mean, 20 years ago, would you ever think of 111 Murray was going to be a luxury condominium? I wish I would have imagined it. If I did, no, I, I, would have, I, I, I would have. I would have bid on Larry's I, 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 on Larry's deal. And yeah, but but, because, but, but I didn't but have that but, vision. Okay, I but, wish I did. Okay, but let's look at also the situation you bought with Ruby, uh, the Woolworth Tower. What year? Uh, Nineteen ninety-seven. Nineteen ninety-seven. Ruby so, Strong. Yeah. So now we're talking nineteen years later. The Woolworth Tower is a, still a great office building, and on the top. 20 floors, it's mm -hmm. being converted to luxury condos, you know, to compete with you, but you're pretty much sold. So, you know, both of you do well. Well, I'll give you even more perspective. I mean, I remember, Larry, you had a building on Water Street, didn't you? Actually, you know, it's 120 Wall Street. 120 Wall, Wall Street, right. right? Do you remember when you began your lease up and it was all to not-for-profit corporations? Correct. I remember, I remember it, well. it like it was yesterday. Yes. Right, because that was... It was yesterday. <laughs> right. It was also this perspective at that time that they gave you the fact that you didn't have to charge taxes because it was created for nonprofit. I don't think anyone in those early days ever expected that you would see the renaissance that we see today with that 24-hour community. And I can tell you this, Michael, I was on a rope line on 9-11 because I went down there with two friends of mine who were ex-cops. And I can remember that we brought generators into the Woolworth building to sleep the ESU uh, officers and the uh, 10th Precinct, who were uh, down there at the time. I went down there every day. There was a guy on a Humvee at Canal and Broadway with a 50 caliber machine gun pointing uptown. And no one could have ever thought that, the sit that downtown would come back in the way that it has. We knew maybe you had faith, but no one could have ever foreseen this renaissance. And this is the most incredible renaissance. Uh, I, I mean, it is remarkable. Who's looking at space in your office buildings today? Are we having the same people who are looking at Hudson Yards, looking at the Lower Manhattan? I think people look. Everybody looks at everything. Yeah, the, but then they finally funnel out and they, they come to one or two major first choices and make their decision accordingly. It's, it's been a whole, the whole shift in the commercial office market has really been all of Manhattan. You look at Midtown, Midtown South, Downtown, and Hudson Yards, all in that same search obviously that may not, that may not be in the same day but they look all over and then finally they you know they go through their matrix of decision and they choose one hopefully it's us downtown but you know, no, you you know we also have some other other owners here you know <laughs> who have other property but what are the benefits for a tenant to move into the trade center sites well, tax benefits. Yeah, there's a number of economic incentives which accrue to on an annualized basis between six and eight dollars per square foot over the life of the lease. But in addition to that, there's just the environment. Uh, you know, truly Lower Manhattan downtown has become a very you've got diverse. eleven mass transit lines right. all converging downtown at the Trade Center in that color travel design path terminal. It's all in there. You can go to any place you want in the metropolitan area of New York and the path terms, the path trains in New Jersey. And it's, it's immediate, it's instant, and it's total. And so there isn't anything that's excluded. There isn't any way you play. You know any how many people are coming through there? 350,000 a day through the path and the subway there every single day. We pitched the, the sales, the condominium sales at 111 Murray based on all that traffic that was coming, that retail traffic that was coming through. And, and Scott's in-laws who now have taken a space there, right. London, Jewelers, London Jewelers, they asked, they actually asked us to come see that physical space uh, well before uh, Apple was announced and all those other tenants. And we were blown away by what, what that was going to be just because the, the, the volume, the volume right. of yeah. people from A, the subway, and B, the path. It's incredible, mm -hmm. by the way, what's happening down there. Also, the, the beauty of what's been created down there, the architectural quality. I mean, I think the, the path terminal, whatever people say about it, Forget about the costs and so forth. That'll, people will forget that. It's a magnificent facility. No, and nothing like this. Now, has the retail, the retail hasn't opened up in the path Not terminal yet. yet. No. You know, the retail downtown, you, you say to a, a retailer who's contemplating coming to the downtown market, and they already have uh, locations maybe in Flatiron and on Fifth Avenue or in Soho. And they say, well, we've got locations. My first question is, do you want a store in Chicago? Of course. Well, if you consider that below Chamber Street is the size of Chicago, are you missing that customer? 
And so a bell goes, a light goes on in their heads. They say, oh my God, you're kidding. Because nobody has a really good understanding of the dynamic of this downtown market. It's, it's incredible. 60,000 people, the, the, number of, the number of museums. What makes retail viable and successful is transportation, museums, residential. Everything is their office. There's nothing missing. Right. And so it would be, it wouldn't make sense for it not to work. That, that's really what it comes down to. It has to work. I mean, for Saks Fifth Avenue to open up a yeah. brand new department store downtown, I mean, that, that, that shows the vibrancy to make Pretty a commitment exciting. over yeah. there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and look how successful Century 21 is. I mean, if you ever walk into Century 21, you hear every different dialect of the world because they're going over there. Yeah. Who's buying at, um, at your property at uh, 111 Murray? A lot of people hear, and they, they hear the Chinese are buying the Russian, but I've seen, especially like at Charles, which mm -hmm. it was more of people who were New Yorkers buying and upgrading. Uh, well, that's why I said everyone. And by the way, I live at Charles, and I shop downtown and I'm going to shop as as a lot more of the retail happens why it's an easier trip for me first of all I can take a city bike down there right. I can walk down there I, it's fabulous I walk to my office as it is on 57th Street but for me to walk instead of going up to a department store uptown for me to walk down to uh, uh, your retail where that where, that Westfield has mm -hmm. that, that's that's it's a 10 minute walk for me yeah. it's it's fat, it's huge I mean the their pull, their demographic pull down there is not just from Tribeca and the yeah. financial district. It's Soho. It's, it's all West over. Village. It's I all mean, over. there's huge buying power down there. And in terms of who we sold to, we sold 150 Charles in 12 and a half weeks, with 70 or so percent sold at 111 Murray, which is pretty strong in a somewhat challenged condominium market out there today. Larry is also probably exceeding us in sales, I would bit. say. You're open up a little bit longer yeah, than us, but bit, still. Yeah. But the point is, there's always a buyer out there. I talked to Howard Lauber about this today. There's a buyer to price. And now, and, and I think if you price correctly, then people are coming to buy. And who, is, who are those people? Plenty of New Yorkers, some foreign capital. But remember, foreign capital is constrained from coming into this marketplace for all kinds of reasons. You have sanctions with, uh, in, in Russia, so the Russian buyers are out of the market. Here, Miami, London. You have a challenged market for the Chinese to get their capital out, and yet people, foreign capital is still coming in here. And I will offer, I'll, I'll give you, I'll posit the following. If Brexit happens, and if you read the polls, it looks like it's going to happen, you will see an enormous, in my view, an enormous rotation of foreign capital into New York. Because they'll all be frightened of, of, of London investments, and you'll see a huge rotation into New York. Let's talk about the Four Seasons. I mean, this is going to be a true five-and-a-half, six-star hotel. Tell me about it. 189 Keys. Right? It's a completion. We're going to open it right around Labor Day. And uh, it will be a first-class facility, a typical Four Seasons facility um, with amenities I like to do laps. So we'll have a 75-foot swimming pool on premises for laps. Um, you name it, every kind of facility you could think of will be there. And it's, it's a luxury hotel. In and the people who live standard, in the building, condo owners we'll have, have, to have the access to all correct. the Four Seasons correct. facilities. Everything. And 24-7 24 services at the push of a button, and up they go. And everything and they do very is very class. I just came back from Seattle. I stayed in the new Four Seasons there, and it was it was fabulous. And you're gonna, now what's I'll bet you you're gonna exceed what, what's that. What's happening with the, other, with the other rental building? I mean, you still have your interest in Hanover, don't you have? A, no, no, I sold it to UDR. UDR, UDR right. so I, I thought you kept. So I have an interest in the sense that I took operating units back. Right, but ha what's happening in the in the rental market in the in Lower Manhattan today? How do you see that? The AIG building is supposed to be opening up at Seventy Pine. Well, the residential. The residential. Residential. I think New York is the number one gateway market for real estate pricing in the country, which probably qualifies it as maybe the best in the world today. But we've also had huge job growth in the last five or six years. I want to say roughly 550,000 people. And in a world where 
more Dodd-Frank regulation is being enunciated every single day, and I, I would bet you Larry agrees with this. I was a legislative aide for Senator Javits. I've said it three times on your shows, now I'm going to say it a fourth time. That's anti-New York legislation. <laughs> That's just a fact. And Javits and Moynihan would have never countenanced it, but you have to, I think, rents go up if jobs are in this, coming into this town. And so as you see jobs, then you're going to see rents go up. And as you see jobs, you're going to see Larry and the Durst organization lease more space out there. And so Speaking, speaking of that, that, how much space, and I'll ask, this is more on the office question to Eric and to you, Larry, is being absorbed by the TAMI position today, the technology, you know, automation, media, and internet? I think the biggest, the biggest factor, 50% of the office stock in New York is over 60 years of age, right? These are most large corporate users are in buildings that are old today that don't function for them any longer. And it's impossible for them to retrofit today's technological requirements into large corporate space. They gotta move out, install it, then move back in. The inconvenience is tremendous. So the one of, one of the advantages new buildings bring to New York is first class space that is, that is designed uh, with environmental concepts, concepts in mind. They've got a low carbon footprint. They are buildings that contain every conceivable technological advance that any corporate tenant wants. And so the result is today, corporate tenants today are beginning to increasingly occupy space in these large buildings. And the wide open floor plates, and the new construction affords these wide open floor plates, which gives you flexibility for different types of layouts. So the Tammies, the technology, advertising, media, and information companies, or a law firm, they can use the same floor plate. They'll use it differently, but they can use it and they can use it efficiently. And you get more people into right. the same amount of space. But I, but I density increases. I think those Tammy tenants have been huge. Huge. Oh, oh, absolutely. I think they filled the hole that was created when Dodd Frank mm -hmm. was was first brought forth. I mean, I say it all the time. But for the Bloomberg Initiative with, to bring technology. Uh, um, uh, uses here. Absolutely, phenomenal. it was as bold a, a governmental move as I, as I've ever seen. Uh, the it's the equivalent of Giuliani's downtown revitalization. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible legislation, and look at what's happened. By the way, we're the second largest generator of tech jobs in the country today. Look and at Google. Amazing. Google yeah. was transformational, and it's, it's, and interestingly enough, transformational for the retail around it. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, I think it changed me. Pack. What's happening with the seaport? The retail down. You know, the they put it. They have IPIC. Um, it's actually beautiful, and it's juxtaposed with Brookfield and with Westfield. So you, you have the coverage for retail, for entertainment, all across the, the downtown market. I think over time it'll be successful. You know, they're marketing it now, and they're becoming much more active. Howard Hughes has, they have the time and the money to wait, and that's what's very important, because these things don't happen overnight, particularly... I, I can only speak to the retail. From a retail perspective, the discussion, the negotiation, getting a landlord and a tenant comfortable with a deal, the design. One thing that's interesting, though, that you mentioned is those floor plates because the retailers for so many years, the constraint in retail has always been refitting and retrofitting space that was never built specifically for retail. For retail. And so now they're looking at the, all these new developments saying, oh, my goodness, I can really build the kind of store I right. want to. Mm. It's with usable. the efficiencies, <laughs> loading, things yeah. that are it's functional. so simple, but they're not simple if you're doing something midtown. Now, what, what are we seeing? You know, I know Nobu has, signed, yeah. has announced that they're signing a lease at yeah. uh, uh, one, 190, 195, 195, 195 yeah. Broadway, you know, and then there are other... Are we seeing any major other restaurant uh, operators opening up downtown? I, I'm not sure about the, the restaurant operators, although there are many. I think what's interesting is that you're getting a tremendous number of apparel users, which really drives the retail because of like kind, they want to be there of other, if others are. I mean, H&M, I understand, is doing very well. You've got Zara today. Um, the, you have the, Uniqlo downtown yet? No, but Uniqlo... I don't think they're looking at the moment. They actually looked at 23 Wall, but it was too big for them. We represented that. And uh, I don't know that they're necessarily the right ones anyway. But you're seeing anyone who is on Fifth Avenue, and I'm not talking about the luxury. Some of the luxury, yes, but primarily the, the tenants that exist on Fifth Avenue today are now looking. They're also in Soho. This is just another important trading area 
for retail. S since you're so active, you know, you're in, active in Times Square and other places, w would you do another development in Lower Manhattan now? If you had an opportunity? Resin residential? I, I, no, would be the answer for right now. Yeah. But not having nothing to do with downtown. I just think that we're over inventoried on residential right now. And we've, and everyone's Condo gotta, residential. Condo. And everyone's got to take a drop of a breath. And I think it's probably a healthy thing, so what, right? What, the banks so, have cut so back. What, what, and what, so do we, what do we need? What, what, is, what is missing for downtown? We have the hotels, okay? We're now going to have some luxury five-star, which we didn't have in Lower Manhattan, okay? When Westfield finally opens up the Oculus and, you know, the, the, the space in your building, there'll be that, plus the transportation center. What you need is rental housing. In Lower Manhattan. You need right. rental housing in the city of New York. You can't get rental housing today because the numbers don't work. One of the reasons the numbers don't work, because you have you lost 421. No more tax benefits. Tax benefits. Right? And without that, you're not going to have rental housing constructed at all. And that's what's happened in New York. There's nothing, nothing going forward. You know, there, there are two major things which people are talking about all the time. It's, you know, the co-living and the co-working. Over here, you know, the WeWorks who leased 4.1 million square feet last year, you know, going into the variety, you, you know, and th there's something uh, I just read um, and I wrote about it next week. Uh, there's something where there's a co-working opportunity where they're putting child care, combining it. So for a different type of co Millennials are having children. Right. That's and exactly, they're staying in the city. That's right. exactly right. So they're doing this situation. It's also very small, limited, very limited space housing, extremely limited. Right. So wh what's your thoughts of uh, all of this co-working, co-living, especially in lower Manhattan today? Because I, they're I taking the older buildings over there. They're not, they don't care about the open floor space because they want to get Rube something. Billy did a project with them at one, one, right, one, one, uh, I think 110 Wall Street. 110 Wall Street. Yeah. I think, it's, I think it's important. People want to live in the city because they want everything in front of them. They want amenities, and amenities are these things you're talking about. But I, I, I think Larry's, part of Larry's point is it's, it's not just rental housing. It's somewhat affordable rental housing. And that's, you know, that's a, a relative concept. It's not just affordable for... That's why when I do my Jersey City show, all of the developers are overjoyed because they can go and get affordable housing or perceived affordable housing in Jersey City at $50 a foot as compared to being in Lower Manhattan where they're paying $80 a That's foot. Correct. So they'll fight and fight to be on the path, mm -hmm. which will take them a little while, but it's convenient. And the, the, the price and it works for their pocketbooks. The, right. it, the price differential is over there. But if we're going to have job growth here and so forth, we've got to have housing, rental housing that works for everybody. I, I remember when I first practiced law here, I got an apartment because I worked for Jerry is Schrager. That was when you were with Hamilton, you know, you, you and Hamilton, Alexander. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but how did I get an apartment? I mean, it was the old way. I, I worked for I worked for Jerry, and we we represented Dan Brodsky, and he had the Bagel Nosh building on Seventy First Street, and I got an apartment for a hundred sixty dollars a month, and that's what allowed me to stay in New York and then build a life here and so forth. And so, I think New York is we need we need rental housing, and it's a big deal. And it's four twenty one. It's the cost of it's the cost of land Steve, that, that goes remember, into it. We used to build 40, 50,000 units of rental housing every year I in know, New York. I know. Nothing. For, first of all, construction, cause it, and it's not just 421A, yeah. but 421A is huge. It's the cost of the land. It is the fights over density. In a city like this with barriers to entry and where, where you're bounded by rivers, you've got to have height. I mean, you simply have to have it. Seattle understood it, and you've got to have it here. And, and construction costs are high here. So we've got to solve for all of those different things. And I think if we do, then we'll have a city that, uh, that people will stay and, and grow in. What's, what's left to be completed at the Trade Center? Is there, okay, the museum is open right now. Everything is done. The retail's coming in. Tower 3 has be finished in 2018. Tower 2 is the last, the final tower, the final piece at the and Trade Center. The, and then it's done. How much of your building is media today at One World? Probably a good third to 40% of the building. Um, we have a lot of technology companies. Um, 
we recently uh, secured uh, one of our larger f first financial services companies. Sorry, Larry. That's okay. Um, we couldn't accommodate them. Okay. So <laughs> Ameriprise is, uh, is uh, moving from seven to one. Um, we're about two million square feet leased, a little under, little under a million square feet to go. What's happening at the Woolworth? We're pretty much leased up. We sold the top, and they're developing that. NYU is still your lead yeah. tenant yeah. in mm -hmm. the building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's, it, downtown is, people, people are, are good with, with living in downtown. And I'll just tell you one thing. I, you know, sometimes I go out to Long Island for the weekends. My commute from Long Island to the West Village, which, by the way, is in effect like living in, like going down to the World Trade Center, is almost equidistant in time to my old commute from Long Island to the Upper East Side. You come through the Midtown Tunnel, you make a left on Lexington, you come down to the teens, mm -hmm. you come right across, and bang, okay, you're home. I used to think that it was going to take me another 30 minutes. Not at all. And it doesn't, it no. doesn't, it's, no. it's, 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 and it's, it's, well, the it's swift. Yeah, the beauty of downtown, I commute from Long Island as well, and I used to go through Penn Station to Bryant Park. My commute is identical to downtown at One World Trade because I can also go through Atlantic Terminal if I like and come that way. Joe, and what, what new tenants do you see coming downtown? We need more restaurants. We need more fine dining. But th that really is a function of people living there. And so as more people move in, there'll be more reason for that. I know in Brooklyn, starting in probably a couple of months, the Alamo Draft House movie theater is going to open up. Yeah. Uh, do you see any... Uh... Well, you have IPIC, which right. will be opening out Howard Hughes. Um, I, I think you're going to see really literally a duplication of what you see in the rest of the city. Um, whether it's sports apparel like Nike or it's Ann Taylor, people that I know well and who I work with, everyone's looking downtown. What about entertainment venues like Larry has on 42nd Street, the Lucky Strike? Uh, do you see bowling? Do you of see course. Any? Anything that serves that You're community. You're going to see something else is coming. And you a know, performing arts center. That's, that's, I know. That's, yes. that's, that's, that's coming. That's, yes. that's, that's, I, I was waiting for you. That's for, coming. That's so when is the performing arts center? We'll have more, more to talk about that shortly. It's another show? Very soon. Good. <laughs> no no question like about that. it. So, so in essence, you know, as we've done many shows in downtown. And you've got the waterfront. That waterfront is amazing. No, that's thank, what we thank said. Thank you. That's I mean, that waterfront, I, I look out of my window. It's they're kayaking. Beautiful. They're jet skiing. Yeah. They're sailing. Yeah. I mean, it's fabulous. Right. Fireboats are out there doing displays. It, it's, it's, <laughs> it's it, by the beautiful. way, you, you might yeah. as well be on Dune Road in the Hamptons. It's so, it's so wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's, and, and I watch the people who are sitting in the, at Hudson River Park up and down, yeah. and the dogs and the bicycles. It's families. And it's the joggers. Really <laughs> it feels, I, I say it all the time, it feels like a community down there. there it is. The yeah. whole extended downtown area. It's, it's a, young, concert, it's a young, vibrant community. It's right. just, fa I mean, it's really fabulous. So a lot has happened in 15 years, and it's only getting better, and I'm happy that... Uh, you know, it's amazing. We paid $3.2 when we bought the Trade Center in 01. I think at this point, we've probably expended somewhere around $25 billion to replace it. Now, it's replaced in totally different, totally different style, different quality, and uh, vastly superior buildings to what was there but the trans the the transition is so complete it's so total in terms of the of the the majesty the quality of the improvements that are there today it doesn't it doesn't equate in any way to what was there back in 01 it's a different downtown totally different and i'd like to thank larry silverstein pleasure joanne podell eric Engelhart, and of course steve whitkoff for being here. See you next week.